Good morning and welcome to today's reflection. Now we all love gardens, don't we? Well, probably some more than others. Today we have reached chapter 90 in Robin Gamble's book, Jesus 100, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, where we find Jesus in a garden. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Now, according to Robin Gamble, gardens are special places in the Bible. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells us that we were made to live in a garden, a serene place of fruitfulness and natural beauty, where men and women could meet with God. At the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there is a new garden at the heart of the new Jerusalem, with the river of life flowing through it, while on each side of the river grows the tree of life. Here, between those two books, we find Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry, in the garden of Gethsemane, alone, knowing what will happen in the hours to come. It is here that his humanity is tested to the limit. Reading the rest of this chapter brings it home to us just how much he was to suffer. So as I think about those verses and how today we are still in that period between Genesis and Revelation. So where is Jesus? Where is God today? One of the questions we all ask at some time, why do bad things happen to good people? Another is, why does God allow evil into this world? That's a big question. A question that many thousands of books have been, writ have been written as a great many scholars and theologians have tried to answer. A question we just don't have an answer to. The Bible, in books such as Job, teaches us that there are many answers. There are no easy answers when things go wrong. It also tells us that the ancient Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years and how early Christians were persecuted and martyred. Jesus too tells us to expect pain and difficulties in, li in life because he warned his disciples that in this world you will have trouble and that nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Although we know a lot now about how our world works, for example, why the likes of earthquakes happen they still bring untold destruction and great loss of life, and nations are still rising against nations today. In those verses from Luke, Jesus mentions both temptation and God's will, two things that are almost polar opposites. Thinking back to that first garden, the Garden of Eden, Genesis paints a picture of what can only be described as perfection. Adam and Eve had everything they needed, but we all know what happened next. By ignoring God's will and falling into temptation, first Adam blamed Eve, and Eve in turn blamed the serpent, which led to them being expelled from the garden. This is something that has been repeated down through the centuries. Well, we might have all we need, there is always something more, far more, that we want. And as much of history can confirms is that when people are tempted to go all out for what they want, Lives are trampled underfoot in that quest. When we fall into temptation, we can always find someone or something, such as an ideology, to blame, to use as a convenient excuse. If I look back less than 100 years and take two names of well-educated and reasonably wealthy men, Heinrich Himmler and Mohammed Atta, they probably had all they needed, yet for reasons no more only to themselves, they wanted more. A lot more, no matter the cost. Himmler being the architect of much of the terror during World War II, and the fanaticism of Atta being in part responsible for the terrible events of 9-11. Even though we are far from perfect, we can still use our free will to choose to follow God's will, to use the gifts and abilities he has given us. Gifts and abilities that help shape the lives of Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa, for two examples. But those things still help our nurses and teachers. 
in our school teachers to make our world a better place. So where is God when tragedy strikes? God, I believe, is an ever-present force. His Holy Spirit is always with us and seeks to comfort us in our suffering. While God neither causes bad things to happen nor prevents bad things from happening, neither does God interfere with the natural consequences of cause and effect. The rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. But God stands with us. God does not stand in the way though. While the Bible tells us that there will be difficulties in life, we need to remember that it also tells us of God's promise to be always with us, a promise that only needs our trust. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, the flames will not consume you. Verses I assume most of us can recognise. But I want to finish with words taken from the 23rd Psalm. The Lord's my shepherd, I, I will not want. He makes me to lie down in pastures green. He leads me the quiet waters by. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. You rod and staff, they comfort me. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. And in God's house evermore my dwelling place shall be. Amen. Well, have a good week. And whatever you do today and this week, if we can all do it with a smile on our face, we will do it. We will make this world, this community, a better place. So bye for now.